You know, there's a word in the King James Version of the Bible that I just love. It shows up in the first chapter in Genesis, and it's in the last chapter in Revelation, and then a thousand times in between. And that one word is behold. Behold. And it just means look. Almighty God, his prophets, his apostles, the psalmist, Jesus Christ himself, more than a thousand times feels the need to say in the word of God, look, behold. Now, why is that? I suspect, and Louis spoke a little bit about this last night, that sometimes it's just so hard for us to hold our attention on what really matters. And this is kind of funny if you think about it because Almighty God who made you, the one who has given us life, he wants to give us the most important information possible about who we are, about who he is, about what this life is all about, and he's having trouble holding our attention. And so he feels the need a thousand times in the Bible to say, look, behold. And so likewise, in what I feel is just a, a holy moment with you today, before I share just one thing that Jesus wants you to hear, because he said this to you, I just want to say, behold. And here's the thing that Jesus said to you. You are the light of the world. Now, we know from Scripture that Jesus is called the light of the world. But on the Sermon of the Mount, he turns around and speaks to his followers, to you and to me, and he says, you are the light of the world. And then he goes on to say, let your light so shine among others that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Behold, this is God's plan for bringing glory to himself in the world. It's to raise up sons and daughters of light who show the world what his goodness looks like. Now, obviously, God doesn't need to do this, right? He could directly show his love and his goodness to the world all by himself. But look, look at the plan. Behold this. Almighty God has decided instead to show his goodness to the world through you and through me. And the stakes of this decision by God are super high. Why? Because there is so much darkness in the world, right? Just today, more than 20,000 kids are going to die just because their parents are too poor to keep them alive. Just today. 40,000 people on average today in our world will be forced to flee out of their homes, leave their homes because of violence and persecution. That's the number of everybody gathered at Passion today. That's the number in our world who are going to become refugees and displaced people today. And there'll be another 40,000 again tomorrow and then the next. 
There are 100,000 children in America who right now are in the midst of a dangerous and scary foster care system and they are totally ready for adoption, but there's no family that will take them. You know this because Louis was speaking of it last night, that just over the last decade, suicides of young people, that is people who are feeling in such despair, such loneliness, such darkness, that they are ready to end their life, this has risen in the last 10 years by 70%. In sociology, there's no statistic like that in our history. And in a world of such darkness, of such suffering and hurt, what is God's plan for making it believable that he is a good God? It turns out that you are that plan. And that God doesn't have another plan. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine among others that they will see your good works and then give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, honestly, for me, sometimes this just feels like, well, God came up with a terrible plan, right? <laughs> But I can't be unclear about what it is that Jesus said is the plan. And if we can just behold this for a moment, what I think that God wants us to see is how seriously he takes your existence. If you got up this morning like wondering whether or not your life matters, hear the words of Jesus that you're the light of the world. The maker of the universe has decided, he's decided this, to put his reputation on the line in the world today on whether or not his children manifest his love and goodness in the world. But honestly, again, if you're like me, you feel like, well, well that's overwhelming. I'm not sure I want that job. I thought we weren't supposed to be anxious and everything. I mean, and now you want me to be the light of the world. And this is exactly the way our spiritual adversary would like us to feel. He'd like us to feel totally overwhelmed by the darkness in the world and overwhelmed by the, how unqualified we are for this job. And he wants us to feel this way because he wants us to feel like it's our job to drive out all the darkness in the world, and it's not. It's God's job. And he's awesome. And he's going to do it. What's your job and what's my job? It's a doable job and it's a simple job. It is just to take our little light into the darkness so that God can gather it up and build a bonfire. This is what God does. He builds bonfires from just little teeny lights. 22 years ago, it's exactly the same year that Passion Conferences started. Some friends and I had a dream about trying to bring our little flickering light of love and hope to victims of violent abuse in our world who were very, very poor. And we called it International Justice Mission, IJM. And we started out in this little closet in my home. This is the first global headquarters of International Justice Mission. <laughs> and then in a short time, we exploded to a staff of two <laughs> and three interns. And one by one, we started taking just individual cases of very poor people suffering from horrific violent abuse. A little girl sold into a brothel by sex traffickers. Maybe a widow who's been run out of her home in Africa by some men with machetes. Or maybe a family who's been sold into slavery in a brick factory. Or maybe some abandoned girl who's been horrifically raped in a slum. Or maybe some young dad who's being tortured by the police who are just trying to steal money from him. 
We started to take on these cases just one by one. And honestly, at the beginning for every case where we saw light prevail, honestly, there were 10 or 20 where the darkness beat us. But we just didn't go away. And a few months ago, Shelly and Louie joined us as IJM gathered together all 1,000 now of IJM staff around the world, lawyers and criminal investigators and social workers. We gathered them from all over the four corners of the world in one place to just worship and thank God because he'd taken our little lights and he'd driven out the darkness for more than 20 years. And he didn't do it just once or twice. He's done it more than 47,000 times. Turns out you just bring your little light and God builds a bonfire. Now that might seem obvious and even believable to you now, 20 some odd years later, but I just wish you could feel how scary and impossible this felt when we started. Especially because of the particular kind of darkness we were heading into. We were heading into the darkness of violence and violence will fight you back. 20 plus years ago, we could see Christians bringing their light in amongst the poor and they would bring food for the hungry and medical care for the sick and fresh water and education. But when the poor were suffering from violent abuse, when they were being imprisoned, enslaved, beaten, raped, and robbed, the body of Christ was bringing no light. Now to understand what I'm talking about, for a moment I'd like you to behold David. I've known David for more than 15 years. And he has suffered and been afflicted by just about every imaginable sorrow in this fallen world. He grew up in a small town slum in a town just about three hours north of Nairobi, Kenya. And by the age of 10 years old, his dad was gone, his mom was in prison, and he was left to take care of himself to try to survive on the slum street, streets as a 10-year-old by himself taking care of his little baby brother. He fed himself with rotten vegetables from the garbage to stop the hunger. He sheltered himself in dark corners to keep away the, the darkness and the terror of night. He medicated himself with glue to help overcome the pain of the beatings he sustained at night and the wounds he buried deep in his heart, all as a, just a completely forgotten little kid living on the streets of a slum. But then miraculously, thanks to some amazing Catholic nuns, David was rescued. He actually survived for 10 more years he came to know the love of Jesus. He got off the glue, got into school. And David actually graduated from high school. In fact, through grit and this irrepressibly cheerful spirit, sweet David actually went on to build a little street business. And he was helping serve AIDS victims in his community. And he was even winning the heart of his little high school crush, Beatrice. <laughs> but then the darkness of violence struck. One afternoon, a drunk, marauding police gang snatched David off the street, robbed him, shot him, and left him for dead in the street. In this one single moment, all that hard work of survival and all the faith and struggle and love of his church community around him was thrown to the ground in a bloody mess as two rounds from a government-issued firearm ripped through the upper part of his hip and then through the bones in his arm. The blood began to pool around him on the ground 
as he just started to see barely a medical sign of a building across the street as he started to lose consciousness. His desperate legs sort of propelled him across the street and he fell unconscious inside the doorway of the hospital. There the doctors and nurses were able to stop the bleeding. They were able to save David's life, but not before they had to actually amputate that that one hand. Now, when the police had sobered up enough to realize that the prey was not actually dead, they crashed into the hospital, they threatened the hospital staff, they chained David with with a handcuff to the bed, and then they accused him of a violent crime that gave them the authority to hold David as long as they wanted. And eventually, He was moved to a prison, and this was the absolutely suffocating hopelessness that confronted David. His right hand was gone from his body. And now these corrupt authorities were holding him and hiding him and had to keep him in jail so that he would be hidden from the courts to bring justice. And of course, the clock is ticking against him because these infections in his body and the diseases of his cellmates are working in his thin body. And even if his name is called out someday somewhere in a courtroom, the judge will never hear his story because he doesn't have a lawyer. He can't afford one. David can't afford a new pair of socks, let alone a lawyer. For years, the people of God had walked with David to overcome abandonment, hunger, homelessness, disease, and addiction. They actually provided a pathway so that he could come to know Christ. They provided a pathway to education, to community, to livelihood, and a future. These were the needs the body of Christ knew how to deal with, and they were good at it. And in fact, against the odds, David was able to overcome poverty and thrive. But then violence ripped it all away. And this was the one sin the body of Christ was not equipped to address. So where could he turn to help, turn for help? Well, to be honest, nowhere. More than 20 years ago, there was not a single Christian ministry focused on the singular problem of violence against the poor. And so 20 years ago, this is where the world was, and consequently, this is where David was, without hope, without light, or so he thought. But in the words of the prophet Isaiah, Behold, says the Lord, I am doing a new thing. Even now it is happening. Can you see it? Indeed, David couldn't see it. But it was just a few years before that God invited this small group of friends to launch this thing we called International Justice Mission. And we had no idea what the larger thing was that God was going to do, but we wanted to begin to address these kinds of cases. And so we sent this brave young lawyer from Colorado and she went to Nairobi. She recruited a a small team of lawyers, including Joe Kabugu and Victor Kumau. And it was Joseph who first found David gaunt and chained to that hospital bed. And it was Victor who took on his case. And I just want to say for all of you who hear Jesus saying, you are the light of the world, but feel overwhelmed by the darkness in the world and the frailty of your own little light, I want you just to see the way God begins to build a bonfire. I want you to behold the way he works because he works with the one I want you to behold the one. I want you to behold David. Indeed, I want you to behold him with your own eyes. Dear friends, please welcome David Makara.
My name is David Makarangure. I stand here as a true testimony of God's miraculous work, which he gets to do through people like you and me. My friend Gary has alluded to those dark days when I had lost all hope. The dark days in 2002, when I felt all alone and without hope. But even in those dark days, God, in his own way, shone the light in my life. And we praise him. Mm. I still remember the events of December 15th, 2002, like it happened yesterday. I was still lying handcuffed to my hospital bed. The police were overheard saying, we get him, we finish him. They were trying to get me out. And I was afraid that I would die in the dark. But the hospital staff refused to let me go. And that same night, that same night, my hand had to be amputated just below the elbow. I woke up the following morning a very bitter person, realizing that life would never be the same again without my right hand. The reality dawned on me that I had started to live a life of a person with a disability. And that was very painful. That was very, very painful. It was at the flower of my youth. I was 22 years old. And now, the police were trying to frame me up for a crime I had not committed. This infuriated the local people. They held protests. They tried their level best to fight the injustices that I was going through. That is when, that is when IJM heard about my plight. Joseph Kibugu was a lawyer working with IJM. He came and found me chained to the hospital bed. As I have already mentioned, I was in great pain. And thinking of hiring a lawyer was out of question, since my family was very poor. Joseph Kibugu came back with an IJM, an IJM lawyer. His name was Victor Kamau. And Victor is a blind lawyer. On seeing Victor, I was at a further loss. I wondered, IJM was bringing in a blind lawyer, honestly, to come and defend me. <laughs> I didn't see any hope. I didn't see any light. I remained hopeless and devastated. But beloved, God uses his own chosen people to bring relief to his flock. Victor Kamau, the blind lawyer, I had no hope in. He ably represented me in court. He worked tirelessly to have the false charges leveled against me dropped. Eventually, the Attorney General released me and the guys I had been arrested with. The police officers were arrested and charged. I was happy and I cried that God is great. Amen. And 
It was that particular time that I saw hope. It was at that particular time I realized that no matter how little you are, no matter how poor you are, no matter what state in life you are, no matter your age, God still cares and he is concerned with the suffering of his children. Mm. Victor told me that it was not through him that I would be freed from prison, but through God. Mm. While I was in jail, I asked God to make me one of the crusaders of justice. I admired Victor and I was challenged by his abilities as a lawyer. I thought that I can also become one of the actors to fight for justice. Even though I'm not very strong, I knew that there's something I can do about it. I felt very bad that a person who is employed by the government to protect me was the one who violated me. That was a paradox which I could not contain. Something I could not even believe, that a person with the responsibility of protecting me against violations was actually the violator for that reason. And due to the fact that we have many of these violations even today, I decided to become one of the crusaders for justice. After I was released from prison, I went on to study law. I kept a photo of Victor, who represented me in court by my bed. So every time I was waking up, I was seeing Victor. And I was even encouraged, very much encouraged. It reminded me that someone who did not even know previously had come to defend me with a zeal and with a strong passion. Victor became my mentor. I finished law school and became a fully qualified lawyer in the High Court of Kenya. <laughs> I prayed for the strength from God and he gave me that in abundance. Today, today, as I stand here, I can say that indeed, God is a faithful God. Amen. In my hospital bed, all those many years ago, I would never have imagined I'll be a lawyer helping my own community fight the injustices they face today. People like Joseph Kibugu, who found me changed in my bed, Victor Kamau, who represented, me, who represented me in court, listened to the voice of God, telling them to go and defend the poor and the weak. And because they used their freedom to set me free, I can now use my own freedom mm. to do something about such things, mm. about such pains that are still existing in people's hearts. Mm. Today, I am happily married to my beloved wife, Beatrice. <laughs> and we have been blessed with three beautiful, wonderful children. Today, I call upon all of us, young and old, <laughs> to work for the thousands of people who are going through abuses and have no one to fight for them. I am personally doing this in my community. May God help all of us and lead us until all, until all are free. Thank you.
Behold. Look. Look at your father. You are his children. When Jesus began his ministry 2,000 years ago, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, it says he began with these words from the prophet Isaiah. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And then in the gospel account, what is the very next thing that Jesus does? He invites his followers to be that light. Many years ago, David was living in the darkness and shadow of death. And Victor, a blind lawyer, you got this, right? A blind lawyer is called into the darkness. He's a follower of Jesus, and he's just taking what light he has into the darkness. And the light overcame the darkness. In fact, Victor rekindled David's light. And now David is overwhelming the darkness as he takes his light into his community. God is building bonfires out of little lights and now he's transforming the nation of Kenya. Victor and David and IJM's local team there in Kenya are part of the largest mass movement in the history of Kenya now, rising up to end police violence in their nation. This year, just this year, Kenya's most notorious and abusive police force was disbanded. And just a few days ago, the New York Times reported on how IJM had helped secure the very first conviction in the history of the nation of a senior police officer for murder. Behold, says the Lord, I'm doing a new thing. Even now it is coming. Can you see it? Behold, you are the light of the world. So I ask you, what new thing of justice and love might God want to do with this generation of Christ followers. There is much darkness. What is the particular darkness that needs your light? There is darkness in our world for sure. There is darkness in our nation. There is darkness in your community. There is darkness on your campus and in your family. If you ask Christ, He will lead you. But here's the new thing I see God doing with this particular generation of Christ followers. Historically, you're a unique generation because surprisingly, there is an ancient evil that has grown larger than it has ever been in the world. And that is the evil of slavery. Do you know there are actually more people in slavery today in the world than at any other time in human history? About 40 million. But also, hear me on this. You are the first generation in the history of humankind that has the tools to end slavery for good. Because for the first time in human history, slavery is illegal everywhere. And in the just the last 10 years, we have discovered and proven the vaccine that ends slavery. When you combine great law enforcement with great services for survivors, slavery just collapses. But most of the world is just simply asleep and they don't know it. At least they were. Until a justice generation of Christ followers started to wake everybody up. Several years ago, Louis and Shelley and friends like Christine Kane began to sound the alarm here at Passion Conferences. And like nothing else, young followers of Jesus began to raise a ruckus on social media, 
They shook the halls of Congress and the White House here. They raised millions of dollars to join the fight. They helped IJM become what is now the largest international anti-slavery organization in the world. And now the world, sitting in darkness, is seeing a great light. I don't know exactly what kind of bonfire God wants to build out of the 40,000 lights that are at Passion 2019. But I know this. Behold, says the Lord, I'm doing a new thing. Even now it's coming. Can you see it? Because you, you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine in this world that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father, your Father who is in heaven. Amen. 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 And amen.